Welcome to the E-Commerce Profits Podcast, where we feature top founders and experts in the e-commerce industry and take an in-depth look at the struggles and successes in growing e-commerce brands profitably. All right. Welcome, everyone. Josh Chin here. I'm the host of the E-Commerce Profits Podcast, where we feature top experts and entrepreneurs in the e-commerce industry and go behind the scenes of the struggles and successes in growing a brand. Now, this episode is brought to you by the E-Commerce Growth Hackers Facebook group. If you own or operate a direct-to-consumer e-commerce business, you're probably drowning in a sea of conflicting advice and info from people who may or may not even have been in your shoes. So skip the noise, join the e-commerce growth hackers private Facebook group, learn from a curated group of e-commerce founders and operators, and tap into the genius of featured specialists on e-commerce growth and marketing. And the best part is it's all free, at least for now. So check out a group on Facebook. That's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash e-commerce growth hackers with a Z at the end. The link is also in the description of this episode, and I'll see you guys on the inside. Today's guest is Chloe Thomas. She is a globally recognized e-commerce marketing problem solver, a longtime marketer. She's also an author of several best-selling books, uh, an international keynote speaker, advisor to e-commerce brands, and host of both the award-winning e-commerce master plan podcast, and the Keep Optimizing Marketing Podcast. And Chloe has been named one of the top 30 e-commerce influencers in 2021. And her podcasts are regularly included in the list of top e-commerce and marketing podcasts in the world. And she's been in the space since 2003, 2003. Uh, She's been on client side, agency side, and advisor side um, all over the place. And over the years, she's helped a countless number of retailers and brands, both large and small. Um, and there's barely a part of the econ landscape that she has not experienced. Chloe, thank you so much for coming onto the show. Gosh, it's fantastic to be here. I feel quite tired actually listening to that list of things I've done. It's like, oh, oh, I feel quite tired. But no, it, it, it's, it's it is 18 years. Yeah, it's amazing what I've been allowed to do and the experience I've got. I, I often say I feel like I've been a kid in a candy shop. For 18 years, it's been uh, it's been a real a real honor actually to do to it, be allowed to do the stuff people have let me do. It it feels like it's it's been 18, 18 years, and it it feels like your passion has it it hasn't gone away, uh, and it's it's hard to imagine doing uh, being in in the industry for eighteen years and seeing things come and go for so long and still maintaining that level of energy and passion that you have. What's your secret? There's always (laughs) something new. I mean, you know, I have been, I have dabbled with different business models over the years. You know, I I ran an agency Mm -hmm. for 10 years. So that was doing e-commerce for other people, but you've got the interest of learning how to do an agency. Um, I'm now almost entirely a podcaster. So I spent time learning how to do that well and how to market podcasts. I've done lead gen stuff and tried to sell courses in the past. Something I am awful at. You know, so there's always there's always something interesting to learn in the business model that I'm running, and then in e-commerce, it's it's just I often talk to people on the podcast who I say, you know, my first question is usually, how did you get into Mm e-commerce? And nine times out of ten, actually, no, not nine times out of ten, at least half of them were doing something else, then accidentally got a job in e-commerce, right, and just were like. I, I've fallen in love. I am never leaving, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> if you, it's the, it's pretty much the only space, probably us and travel where you do your marketing and you almost immediately see the financial impact of that, you know, lead gen and engagement that. are great. There's a place for yeah. them, but give me cold, hard cash. It's so much more fulfilling, so much more exciting. And there are just endless new things coming in. You know, when I started, it was email affiliates, Google ads, and yep. um, whatever Yahoo ads or Bing ads were called at the time. They weren't even yep. called that. Social media basically didn't exist, certainly not the ad side of it. Um, you know, we talk about doing welcome campaigns in our email marketing, but it was 
kind of like a massive brief and then five grand to set it up. Mm. So, you know, it's amazing how things have changed over yeah. the years. You know, if you could get a website built for less than 30 grand, you were doing well back when I started. And now you can set one up for free. So there's, a, there's been a lot to stay excited about over the last you know, couple of decades. Yeah, that makes sense. And it, it's, it's, you know, for, for someone who has been in the space for less than five years, um, it, just experiencing the change that has occurred over the past five years is a, a already pretty um, challenging and daunting on its own. It's, it's, it's a lot. Um, but to imagine things going from what it used to be in 2003 to what it is today and having to adapt every single quarter and every single year, it's incredible. Let, let me take us to the, the start. And I, I'm, I'm really curious about this because I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and you are an Oxford grad. Oh, yeah. Yes. You, yes. you study history of all things. I did. Yeah, I studied history. Tell me that story. Why history, and how do you how do you end up in in marketing out of all things from <laughs> studying history? And that was well, your first job as well. Yeah, Park yeah. Um, yeah. So I I quite arrogantly decided if I could get into Oxford, I was going to study what I wanted. As an intelligent person, I should be able to study right. whatever I wanted rather than something practical. And I thoroughly enjoyed mm -hmm. history. So I went to Oxford. I can get behind that, yeah. And I, I, I'm pretty certain I got in on the state school quota at the time, you know, because they were trying to get less private, you know, less Eton people and more comprehensive people. Poor people, okay. rich people, for those listening and not in the UK. Uh, <laughs> there's a very, very basic broadness on it. Um, and I got in. I spent most of my three years there drinking, um, rowing. Uh, running the newspaper, having a whale of a time, but did learn quite a lot of history and learned a lot of skills I still use today. In the Oxford History Programme, you, um, you have to do a 2,000 word essay on a topic that you probably knew nothing about two weeks ago every week over the course of eight weeks, it's an eight week term. And then on some of the terms, you have to do another three essays on top of that. So some weeks you're doing two. And so you, for example, one of my terms, I was doing, I think, 1700s, and weeks one, two, and three were the French Revolution, which I knew nothing about when I started. So three weeks into it, I'd written 6,000 words on the French Revolution and been quizzed by an expert on the French Revolution about it. Uh, oh and gosh. then the next month was Japan. The month after that was China. I can't even remember where we went after that. So it's, it's intense, but it's, it's actually going, finding the information, distilling it down and writing about it is what I do every day. So in some ways, I'm an e-commerce historian, just a very mm. recent past historian, I suppose. And I look quite a lot yeah. to the future now as well. So that's, that's, that was the history bit. Sorry, you were mainly asking me about what I, what I, how I ended up in marketing. So I decided I wanted to earn some money. This is back when internships paid really good money to students. So right. I was applying for an internship for between my second and third year of my degree. And Basically, you could go into finance, HR, risk, uh, and a few other things. And they all sounded dull, quite frankly, and marketing sounded more interesting. Or it sounded the, hmm. the, wor the least bad of the options. So I'll go for marketing <laughs> and applied to quite a lot of marketing internships. Got the one with Barclays Bank. Had an amazing 10 weeks. Um, none of us wanted to work for the bank here on the internship program. We had a whale of a time. It was a lot of fun. Um, and, but I did learn quite a bit. Uh, then after that summer, we all kind of left the internship going, I'm never working for the bank again. But it was a choice of finals or apply for something else. Barclays had offered me a job, so I ended up working for Barclays. And that's, that's how I was in marketing. And I ended up in e-commerce because I was trying to escape Barclays. And the first marketing job I got was in retail. So um, lots of accidents in my career path, but very happy accidents. And you flourished. Where you're, uh, where, wherever you, you, you ended up and you, you kind of flourished and did really, really well. And at the, I, you were head of e-commerce at a very young age, if I have my yeah. math done right. Yes, what, I was, I was about 2005, wasn't it? So I was 25. Yeah. Yeah. Head of e-commerce. And how, how does, how does that 
you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a lot of, um, that's heavy for, for someone who's a couple of years out of university. How do you handle that? And especially in the, in the space, like back in 2005, 20 to 2007 is where things are beginning to pick up. And I, I believe back then it was called e, e-tail, e-tailing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We did e-tail for a bit. Um, yeah. I was very lucky that the first job I got after the bank was working for a, a, a true multi-channel retailer. So it was a catalog business in the UK that had over 100 yeah. stores and had um, a big, uh, impressive at the time, e-commerce site. And I was brought in as a direct uh, marketer to manage the catalog mailings, which is a great uh, training ground for anyone who wants to do online marketing. And we, you know, so we're multi-million pound business, very, actually not Mm. that successful business because it ended up going under. But I did two Christmases with them. We were selling gifts. So I learned a huge amount. And for the second of those Christmases, my boss, who was head of, uh, was she head of marketing? Yeah, I think she was head of marketing, overseeing all the marketing activity. She was on maternity leave. So I single-handedly um, got to do a whole Christmas. So I, got, I learned an awful lot in the, my 18 months there and then got offered uh, what was, when I, when I had the chat about it, um, it was an e-commerce manager position across um, a consult- for a consultancy who worked across, I think it was between six and 10 e-commerce uh, mail order brands, which dabbled in e-commerce, but didn't really do anything. And on the day I turned up, my new boss was making me a coffee in the tiny kitchen and, uh, and said, I've decided you're going to be my head of e-commerce. I went, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it was, that job was, was 50% having a lot of fun. Um, you know, you've got brands that have, I think one of them, we sent their first ever marketing email and we had uh, 60,000 people on the list and they'd never sent an email. And in get, getting the owner of the business over and going, right, I'm going to hit send and then just watching the cash come in. I mean, it was, it was so exciting. And, you know, going to the big trade fairs and going, hello, I'd like to buy, I'd like to build five e-commerce sites in the next year. Are you up for it? So I learned a huge amount, but it was also, I was seen as a threat by a lot of the rest of the people, people in the business, because they were mail order diehards. You know, it was mm. all about the catalog. The catalog was king. How do we, and it's still a problem yeah. now in the mail order industry. How do you match the attribution online and offline? Mm. Uh, is your email stealing my sales? So a lot of it was also kind of internal PR and not being threatening. Because I, I knew that because I've been working mail order. So I knew that was going to be a conflict. So it's how can we add to that? Um, so yeah, that's how I ended up doing it as a young age. How I managed to do that at a young age, I think just just utter not even realizing it was a weird thing to be doing. It never occurred to me that I wasn't going to achieve it, that I wasn't going to do well, that I was doing something impressive even. I don't think ever really occurred to me. It just felt right. Which maybe is. is a huge amount of arrogance or maybe it's a huge amount of naivety. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe, but I, I think that has brought you to where you're at right now. And let, let's let's bring us to the future a little bit, of the present and then the future. Um, you've spoken with countless of e-commerce brands on your podcast, the e-commerce uh, e-commerce master plan podcast. What is the kind of if you had to extrapolate into kind of the rest of 2022? What do you think is going to be the broad themes coming into the picture, especially with the uncertainty surrounding different variants of, of COVID and not knowing when the world's going to open up again. What's, yeah, th- what are those? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a really, it's, I think actually 2023, sorry, 2022 even is harder to predict than 2020, 2021 as to what's going to happen because 2021, it, we hadn't seen a lot of the macro impacts of COVID happen yet. We were kind right. of, whoa, we've, we've got used to this pandemic thing. Next year will be a bit more of the same, et cetera. But then we've had the whole shipping issue, which, mm. you know, and logistics issue, which is partly in the UK, it's all caused by Brexit, apparently, despite the fact that it's happening everywhere else in the world. <laughs> As if quite clearly not caused by Brexit, not helped by yeah. Brexit, not caused by Brexit. Um, 
but that's ca caused by impacts of COVID and the impact of everyone buy, start, suddenly starting to buy online and consuming more. Therefore, there's less capacity fundamentally. So mm. it's all. Uh, so there's going to be so there's lots of kind of this going on, which are the more kind of practical stuff. Know your supply chain, have backup processes in place, be ready to take back orders, not back orders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, protect your margins. Then we've got um, the 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 other kind of macro impact of what's happened in the last 18 months, which is the whole focus on kind of con conscious consumerism, I suppose, consumers wanting to be connected with something better, wanting to do better in some way, um, even mm. if they're not yet doing it across their whole life, to do better for society, to do better for the planet. And obviously coming off the, you know, the tail end of um, 2021 with COP26, and it just seems like net zero and the environment and our impact on that is everywhere. And consumers mm. care about it a lot more. Government are starting to put pressure top down on businesses to comply, which is going to hit even the smallest business fairly soon. And fundamentally, it's, our, it's the right thing to do. So I think with all of this going on, I think... If, if a retailer doesn't have, how are we going to tackle sustainability, net zero, the climate, whatever that, whatever wording you want? I don't know what the right wording mm -hmm. is yet. But if you're not looking at how your business can, can help on that path, help re-educate the consumers, help reduce carbon and so forth, then you are, you are going to be in a really tough spot come this time in 12 months time. That's really interesting to 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 hear and we, we spoke a little bit before hitting record and you've been obsessing over the topic for the past six ish <laughs> weeks um yeah as a recording <laughs> i i love that and i so one of the questions that came to mind was how do you bridge the gap between you know a sustainable initiative and, and a sustainable agenda versus um the for-profit agenda and how do you bridge that gap or if if there's even a gap in the first place i think i think there is a gap but i think it's it's more a matter of perception that it is one of reality as in mm -hmm. people think there's a conflict between making money and doing well doing right for the planet and yes some businesses some business models just it's just not possible to do the two um, yeah. But there is so many ways of doing it now. I don't think they are a conflict. And there's kind of like the long term view on this. If we don't save the planet, there aren't going to be people to buy your products. So, you know, in five, 10 years time, you are going to see major changes in who is able to purchase and what they're willing to purchase. So if you want a long term success, you've got to join with everyone else and help the planet. You've kind of got the medium term, which is, as I said, governments are starting to bring down legislation and requirements of businesses in terms of, you know, having a path to net zero or an ESG policy in their business, which we're mm. seeing Europe and the UK, I know, are doing it. As you said, I've only been, been swatting up on this for about six, six weeks. I'm sure other people are as well. But, you know, we've got to shout about this, not become experts. So experts, not overnight, <laughs> clearly not yeah, overnight. Of course. Um, so that's coming in the medium term to the smaller businesses because, for example, Tesco, one of the biggest retailers in the UK, they've already put in a requirement for all their suppliers to have a, a net zero policy in place by the end of 2023, which is way too far away. But that sort of thing is going to come and keep you know, being a pressure on us. So sooner or later, someone's going to make you do it. And then short term, consumers want you to do it your staff probably want you to do it your suppliers are probably already on this path and then fourthly if we are reducing the amount of carbon that we use we are fundamentally spending less money therefore mm. we're making more money and if consumers want these ethical choices if we can explain what we're doing and take those steps you know we are going to be helping them they're going to appreciate us for it and so forth so it doesn't have to be you know, you don't have to solve this problem overnight, but if you start taking baby steps, you will very soon find that, you know, your business is, is on, is on the path to, you know, doing well. And there's, we've, we've decided, I've decided, there's no we in this. I have decided that my <laughs> podcast, e-commerce master plan is going to, as of, 
as of now, actually, when you're listening to this, we're already doing this. We've already admitted it to our listeners. Um, we are not just a growth podcast anymore. We are a podcast about how you create a successful e-commerce business and go on the path to net zero. So all my guests are doing something from the teeny tiny stuff to the big stuff. And something which I've been amazed by over the last six, six weeks is how many businesses are doing cool things and also how many easy solutions there are out there. Plugins you can install in a couple of clicks and boom, you're making an improvement. Like Josh, you shared yeah. with me before we were talking about this, EcoCard. EcoCard, just, yeah. Just a brilliant, I hadn't come across that one yet, but you put it in there and the customer can, can pay to offset the thing. Cost you nothing, but shows that you're, you're caring, you're trying, et cetera. Um, exactly. And there's one that, that I'm really excited about, which enables you to um, automatically offset things as people take actions, which is called Ecology, E-C-O-L-O-G-I, which we're hopefully by the time you're, you're listening to this, we'll have it in place on our website. So every time someone signs up to our emails, we plant a tree. Now, it's not perfect. It doesn't reduce the amount of carbon I'm putting out there, but it's better than doing nothing. And we yep. will improve what we do over time. So sorry, Josh, that turned into a, quite a rant. Um, that's good. Uh, that was good. And, and guys, EcoCard, that's spelled E-C-O-C-A-R-T dot I-O. Um, I actually don't know exactly how it functions on the back end, but on the front end, how it, how it actually works is that um, you have a little plugin and a little checkbox that appears at the checkout page where consumers can just click on it, add an additional 1% to their order, which then covers for the carbon emissions that occur as a result of that purchase. Therefore, resulting in a net zero carbon uh, purchase, if that makes sense. But I'm not ex- entirely sure how that money is then put to use to make sure that that uh, that balances out. I'm interested to kind of dive deeper into that, but that's such an easy way. Like Chloe, you you just talked about it. It's, it's surprisingly easy for brands and retailers to just at a click of a button, uh, install a plugin, install an app and move in significantly towards the right direction uh, already. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to think about like, uh, to hear your thoughts about how you, how millennials and the next generation of shoppers would think about something like this. There has to be some kind of a, an improvement and conversions as a result of these sustainability initiatives, because it, it does align with the values of, you know, the people of, of that generation and, and beyond. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the first thing I say is I think all of this is a journey. And as I said earlier, offsetting isn't the total solution, but it's a great place to start. And you mentioned the due diligence and like, I haven't done due diligence on ecology yet. I haven't done due Mm. diligence on EcoCart because I only heard about it less than an hour ago. I'm putting this stuff in place now and then I'm going to do the due diligence later and then I might amend things, but at least we're starting. The other thing is in terms of, you know, bringing the millennials on board, one of the and actually, I don't think it's the millennials anymore. I think it, it's an awful lot of other people too. But we need to to get, we have a big response. I'm trying to, trying to put multiple things into this answer. I'm, I'm failing. So let me give you, there's two key things I want to tell you, tell you about. One is we need to talk about what we're doing because it's a huge pull to consumers. So you've probably mm-hmm. heard of greenwashing. There's also a phrase called yeah. green hush which is businesses which are actually doing good, but not telling anyone about it. Um, Mm. And that's, you know, one of the things I like about the EcoCart solution. It's right there in the checkout. We want you to do good. We want to do good. And ecology as well, because they're for all kinds of widgets. So you can put it in places. People can see you're trying to do good. So we've got, because the more we shout about what we're doing and the steps we're taking, the more other people will follow us, the faster this whole movement will will happen. The other key thing, Um, is that she says, totally forgetting what the other key thing was. Green hushing, it's a journey. And no, go on. (laughs) Sorry, Josh. It's early in the morning here in the UK and the brain is just gone. Nope. (laughs) One thing I'll say is that with, you know, with with these these plugins and and options in place, it's it's really easy for 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 business to kind of take responsibility and say, all right, I'm going to set aside like X amount of like of, of your budget 
or their cost base to pursuing this cause. And you know, businesses might think of this as a CSR type of initiative or ESG type of initiative, but uh, but realistically, I think that itself is offset by the potential gains and the potential cost um, savings that result from. Like you, you were talking about how um, taking away, taking away the return labels could help with reducing the cost by a little bit. Um, I think the next generation of tools and plugins might be some kind of measurement on the upside versus just the sustainably por- sustainability portion of things. Like you saved, um, or you planted a thousand trees and at the same time you saved X amount as a result of doing this. That's going to be really interesting. And that, I think that's where mass adoption can really take off, uh, take off because it, it becomes a no brainer, right? Completely. I remember what I was going to say, which is that the cons- we have a role in the industry of educating consumers because at the moment, the millennials and everyone else is kind of going, I want to do better. I'm not quite sure how. So one mm. of the reasons we need to shout about it is to go, if you, if you make this choice, this is the sustainable choice. This is mm. better. Admittedly, we, we, there are some who are claiming that and it isn't. Um, but we need to help them on the journey by educating them. And and because um, they've got this desire to do good, but they don't yet know what it looks like. Should I buy cotton? Should I buy polyester? It, that is a massively complicated question for yeah. anyone. Um, so, you know, you've got to you've got to help them by explaining how you're doing it and so forth. So by shouting about it, you're also attracting more of the right type of customers to you who are going to embrace you and go on your journey. And I think one of the most fascinating things in this space at the moment is how technology is being used to create solutions, which like, like you mentioned, are both hugely ecologically beneficial and are going to reduce a business's cost and improve a business's profits. So there's uh, an AI solution and data bet, you know, data set being created by a very a lady with a far more impressive history than mine in the fashion space called Sarah Curran. And she's created a business called TrueFit, which has been around for about 10 years, but is really kind of its time is now, I suppose. And what that business does is it enables consumers to upload their own measurements, their own size and shop and un- and match it will this product actually fit me before they buy which makes a happier customer which is great for your profits it reduces your returns and returns are horrible for the planet um yep. it means you're keeping your your stock at full price rather than sending it out and waiting for it to come back and having to sell it at a discount and because this data set is so so big now people are able to plug into this data set and analyze to then work out how they should be sizing their fashion products in future to make them fit more customers. Mm. And we, I had a, a lady back in mid 2020 on the podcast called Camilla Olson, who has been doing a study as part of, um, part of her, came out of kind of her high fashion degree, but looking at what the sizing looks like across the female population. And there's a multi-billion pound opportunity in creating products that actually fit women because um, 80%, I think she said, I'm rem- trying to remember the stats on the fly here, but it was about 70, 80% of women, almost nothing on the high street actually fits them because it hasn't been made for their body shape. So there are huge, the majority of women are wandering around buying clothes because they need something. It doesn't fit. It ends up in the wardrobe. It ends up in the landfill. It ends up being returned. So if yeah. we can manage to create clothes that actually fit people, there's a huge business opportunity there, billions of pounds opportunity by creating clothes that actually fit people. And yeah. it reduces returns, it reduces waste. And, and there's, so there's such a huge business opportunity here, as well as amazing um, outcomes for the planet. And so TrueFit, that's TrueFit.com. Um, they're actually much bigger than I, than I initially thought. They have 17,000 brands and yeah. 84 million active members with over 7 billion rec- recommendations made. And that's, that's significant. I'm, I'm interested to think about... A, a lot of this stuff, sorry to talk over you, Josh, but a lot of this, oh, oh. these solutions are out there. They're tried and tested. We just haven't heard about them. You yeah, know, exactly. they're, just, they're just not something we're talking about all the time. So, which is what yeah. I mean, it's an awful lot easier 
and an awful lot more profitable than than people think, which is why, you know, I love the fact you give me the opportunity to to rant and rave about it here on your show. I love it, yeah. And I, I'm still I'm still for the idea that once once you're able to kind of quantify the impact, the, the profit impact, the thing is gonna pick off so quickly because it becomes a no-brainer. And how 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 often do you see um changes like this being made by the little guys because it's you know a, a lot of these industry level changes are happening from the top down but by that i mean like huge retailers like tesco setting the example and all the little little guys are then following that example but i i don't see a lot of examples where the the independent mom and pop shop or re, the online e-com brand leads the way with an innovative business model aside from maybe Tom's. <laughs> See, I think some of the coolest stuff is being done by the smaller companies because, you know, smaller com- I, lo- I love small companies because they can twist, they can change, they can alter right. things. They can put that vision out there and make it happen. So a couple of people we've recently had on the show, um, there's Eve Keke, who's created the most amazing startup called Bundly, which is a business in the UK doing baby clothing rental by subscription. So when your baby's born, you sign up, you get the naught to three month clothing package. You use that Mm -hmm. when the baby outgrows it, you send it back, you get the three to six month clothing package. It's such, you know, and and then the team at Bundly, they have specialists who, you know, process it, et cetera, and send it back out to people. Amazingly cool uh, way of, reducing all that baby stuff that everyone seems to end up with but also yep. you know making sure those products get get used 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 and they're, they're using suppliers who create more sustainable baby products and all the rest of it fascinating startup business slowly getting traction i see a lot of traction because they are um you know they are re-educating the customer you know you don't have to go and fill your shopping bag with more baby clothes, you can just get it by rental. Yeah. But just an amazing small it. business that's doing cool things. Then there's another one called Martha and Hepsi, who are a small business doing, they, do, they, they create beautiful designs and then put them on lampshades and other products, which is not necessarily the most sustainable business, but because they're products we don't potentially need, but they, um, they create them with great quality so that the products really last price them correctly there's no 10 pound mm-hmm. lampshades on their website and they yeah. did in the run-up to christmas because they do a lot of wrap- cool wrapping paper they right. made their wrapping paper fully recyclable and they were heavily oh. promoting a couple of videos on youtube to their customers one how to wrap presents without using sellotape because of course sellotape is a problem in the recycling process and right. how to reuse your wrapping paper and they, they did an example, and their wrapping paper it can be reused up to seven times, I think it was, um, Pepsi managed to, to do it. But they're, they're working on re-educating the customer to make more sustainable, more sensible choices. And they obviously, they, you know, they, they, they've sorted out their supply chain and all the rest of it. So these are two tiny businesses doing super cool things, and that's, that's who we're now shining a light on the podcast, to inspire other people who are going, this is going to be so hard. No, it's nowhere near as difficult as you as you think, and the consumers will really respond to it. I love that. I love that. And so that's Bundley, B-U-N-D-L-E-E. And what's the other brand? How do you spell it? Martha and Hepsi, which is M-A-R-T-H-A and H-E-P-S-I-E. And I've just looked up um, the business Martha. of Camilla Olson, who I mentioned, who has uh, worked out this amazing opportunity by actually creating products that fit and her business is Savitude which is S-A-V-I-T-U-D-E there you go amazing hopefully everyone's amazing. got their pen, pen and paper ready and are writing down each of those <laughs> as usual links will be in the description um, you can check out currents.agency forward slash podcast for the show notes um, but this is amazing and these are ideas that really any brand can really take um and and then go it's not it's not it's not unique to just lampshades it's not just and i i'm i'm uh i'm kind of at, at odds with 
the idea that in, in e-commerce today, it's all about ROI and it's all about like, and we talked about this before we hit record, like where's the ROI before I invest time, energy, and effort into something. That's kind of the common mindset of, mm-hmm. of a marketer. Um, but I think- so I like the idea of kind of merging that intention of sustainably into the marketing of the product and the brand itself and becoming a core part of the business. I, mean, I, I doubt anyone listening has ever heard that they should really be talking in their marketing about something other than just discounts. You know, uh, they sure, should be yeah. storytelling and they should be putting more content out there. Well, consumers want that emotional connection with businesses. They wanted it before the pandemic. The pandemic has accelerated their desire for it. Their desire to now be ethically conscious and so forth has taken it to a whole other level. Paired to that, we've also got the fact that the cookie apocalypse um, has come, which means you need to, you can't rely on really clever targeting, you know, mm. really nailing that audience. You can't rely on that for your customer acquisition anymore. You've got to get the message right, the creative right. So it's going to be another big trend we see next year is, is I'm, I'm anticipating there's going to be more hiring of copywriters and graphic designers that really get yeah. it. because you've got to get that messaging right. And if you put in that messaging about how you're taking these steps, if you create a video of how to wrap a parcel without sellotape, it shows who you are. It enables the customer to connect better with you. And I guess it then, if we take it to the next level, it then brings in something else I think is going to be huge as we go into, next, into, the, into 2022 and that's going to... Um, kind of fits with combating the cookie apocalypse as well, which is trust-based marketing partnerships. You know, mm. so, so not just giving a load of influencers $100 to yeah. do a post, but building a relationship with influencers who have the same values and are on the same mission as you, whose audience will respond to what you're talking about. You know, you don't need targeting to do this. You're, the, the influencer is your target audience. The yeah. same thing works these days with affiliate marketing. Um, mm-hmm. PR, you can do it via digital PR. You, you know, you can get your your CEO, your founder out on all the podcasts where people are talking about net zero and you know and spread the word of what you're doing. You can also use this for partnerships with other brands. And if you know there's another brand selling a complimentary product who's in your space, who are also doing great things in this, swap emails, you know, send an email about them, mm-hmm. they send an email about you put um, ads for each other on your, your order confirmation pages. Mm. These things will, you know, if you're putting your message in front of consumers who also get and are ready for that part of the journey, then you can really accelerate your new customer acquisition without having to, you know, pay the, the, you know, the increased costs of the ad platforms, both because of the cookie apocalypse and the fact there's just a considerably larger number of people trying to sell stuff online now. You know, the competition levels have gone up. It's becoming more competitive. Mm. So we're going to have to be better marketers, which means partnerships, customer retention, better messaging, emotional messaging, um, you know, and, and perfecting those skills. Ads still have a huge part to play in this, but the creative that goes alongside those ads, I think is going to become, well, it's been on a trajectory of becoming hugely important with, the, you know, the Facebook, the TikTok and the Instagram mm-hmm. platforms, but it's going to go up a level now it's not just about chucking some emoticons in yeah. um, it's about a little bit more than that now yeah the, the quality of, of work has the, the bar has been raised and i I, mm-hmm. I love the idea of building a strong relationship with a couple of influencers that share the same or similar values as your brand because what i like about that is now instead of having to broadcast your values and what you stand for as a brand to a hundred hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, you now build really strong relationships with a select few uh, individuals. And through those meaningful relationships and connections, you then cascade your influence across multiple audiences uh, that share the same value as, as you do. Yeah, that exactly. is we, so much more powerful. There's, we should still do some marketing, which kind of puts our message out to the masses. But if we can use influencer partnerships and press partnerships and partnerships with other brands to enable us to put our message in front of the audience who already get it, who want to be heading in this direction, who want to put their money 
in a more ecological option, a more sustainable option, who want to learn more, then we're going to get so much more traction. And it's, um, I think that's probably quite hard Actually, no, I was going to say it's probably quite hard to do with targeting, but no, Facebook's probably already got it down. So they've probably worked that one out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's sure. it's about those those different layers of the marketing where you put, put your word out in front of everyone and then you put it in front of the target customer. And I think partnerships is going to be the key way for doing that in, um, in the coming year. Perfect. Chloe, last question. If you had a billboard just... Taking this uh, this this idea and this question from from Tim Ferriss, one of my favorite podcasters. Uh, if you had a billboard in the middle of the busiest highway in the country, what would that billboard say? Oh wow! See, see, prior to the last six weeks of getting net zero focus, it would have just said "keep optimizing," which is my personal mantra. Which is find what's bad, yeah. make it better; find what's good, uh, make it better. Uh, yeah. And you know, and nothing's ever finished. But may, maybe. Maybe it's keep optimizing to net zero. Ah. Maybe we go, or, or pos- no, actually, screw, screw that. No, we're going to go with net, get on the journey to net zero. That's mm. what I put. Let's not muddle it up with my own mantras. Let's go get on the journey to net zero. Get on the journey to net zero. I love that. Chloe, thank you so much. What's the best way to connect with you? And if people are interested in learning more about you and your podcast, where can they go to? Best thing to do is if you head to ecommercemasterplan.com, you'll find links to everything I'm up to, the podcasts, um, the books, anything else. Uh, Lots of stuff on net zero, increasingly large amounts of stuff on net (laughs) zero. Um, Come on the journey with me, uh, ecommercemasterplan.com. Chloe, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the e-commerce profits podcast. We'll see you again next time, and be sure to click subscribe to get notified of future episodes.